It sounds like the perfect place to take the kids, since so many of them these days are hooked on dinosaurs. A theme park inhabited by specially genetically engineered species of Tyrannosaurus rex and other big lizards. The park is called Jurassic Park. That is also the title of the latest thriller by author Michael Crichton, the man who brought us the Andromeda Strain and the Great Train Robbery, among others. Good morning and welcome. Mm-hmm. Why do I have a feeling that somewhere in your family life there is a little person who loves dinosaurs? Am I right? There is, yes. Yeah? Yeah. The, the book actually began when my wife and I were waiting for our first child, and uh, we were decorating the nursery, and I began to buy stuffed dinosaurs. I actually bought a lot of them, and it kind of couldn't stop, and eventually she began to say, what are all these dinosaurs, and why is this happening? And the the whole question of children and dinosaurs began to... to Preoccupy me, and I started the book. And now your little girl is what a year and a half. Yes, she's eighteen months. And old. she's as fascinated by dinosaurs as Daddy was uh, in the beginning. Yeah, although I think she takes them for granted in a certain way. You know, I mean, we were, we were going to go to the zoo, and I said, "What are we going to see in the zoo?" And she said, "Zebras." And I said, "Yes." Bears. Yes. She said, "Dinos." <laughs> Has she been reading the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, if she had been reading the book and she went to this particular theme park, that is what she'd see. This is um, sort of the classic story of man's experiment gone in a direction man never, ever wanted it to go. I don't want to spill the beans, so why don't you tell me that the general plot? Well, the idea of it is that, is that um, people are going to make something that sounds like a, a, a terrific thing, a, a island that has recreated dinosaurs on it that people can go and see. And it certainly sounds, you know, at first blush like something I would like, and I think most people respond very favorably yeah. to it. And and so part of why I was interested in the book was to take an idea that seemed like a good idea and show why it might not be a good idea. The book works because it's the kind of thing where you sit there and you wonder, well, gosh, could it happen? Because the whole theory is that the scientists have taken the DNA genetic material that, in fact, is being found in some fossils and somehow managed to uh, convolute it into living, breathing beings today. Can it happen? Because I know you've done a lot of research on this. I, I wouldn't worry about it. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think dinosaurs have been dead for a long time, and, and they'll stay that way for quite a while. Is there another message here, though, that sometimes maybe we tinker with more things than, than we ought to be tinkering with? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm quite concerned that... Um, the genetic engineering is, is about to be a very widespread technology, and that people will have the, the capacity to use it frivolously if, if that's their interest. And so the notion that people might um, want to make square tree trunks for easier lumbering or, or pale trout for um, you know, easier fishing, this kind of, of, of fooling with, with our ecological heritage for, for what I think are absurd purposes, is, is something that we're going to have to deal with. And in the book, what they've done is they've taken long extinct creatures and, and brought them back to life. Maybe there was, there was more to dinosaurs than we thought, and we learn about that when they, when they come to life in here? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think there's a, uh, you know, in reality, any animal that's been dead for such a long time, you know, they've been gone now for 65 million years, it offers the possibility of, of us having fantasies about them in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but I think that um, one of the things the book does is try and imagine what a whole variety of dinosaur animals would have been like. You obviously imagine very well, because all of your books seem to hit a chord, and, and people don't go, oh, this is baloney, it could never happen. Whether it could or not, people tend to think, gee whiz, it might. What's the trick? How do you get your mind to wander in a direction that so many other minds find believable? I th- it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but what I mean by that is that is that very often early drafts don't have that effect. They're they're unpersuasive, and so there's a there's a sort of effort of of trying to, I think, to shore up the argument to 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 make it seem more convincing. And, and the ways to do that are, are different in different books, but it's but it's an effort is the answer. In this one, for instance, did you go back to people in the scientific comi- community and and say, what if, how come, could it be? Those kinds of questions, or do you go to not so much that, and that's because because the the core ideas about how this might be done it, um, it was to to insert a probe into an an, an insect that's that's preserved in amber, mm-hmm. and to try and remove blood that it might have sucked from another animal. 
Uh, th those ideas have all been worked out by academics and have been published. So. Yeah, so taking an idea that, that does exist and running with it, you have come up with one scary book. Michael Crichton, it's great to have you on. Lots of luck. Thank you, Jenny.